ISIS makes its way quietly back into the cyber news and the Australian Signals Directorate is on the case. The Broadband Internet Technology Advisory Group wants the IoT industry to face some unpleasant facts and the security industry calls for standards. Europol finishes its second sweep of money mules. ATM jackpotting spreads in Europe and Asia. India suffers a wave of carding. And security experts warn us all to be cyber savvy on Black Friday. Time for a message from our sponsor, Alien Vault. If you're a regular listener of the CyberWire, you know that a typical attack goes undetected for more than eight months. And that's especially frightening, considering that 90% of all businesses have suffered an attack. So it's no longer a question of whether an organization will be breached, it's when. Better threat detection starts with Alien Vault Unified Security Management. The Alien Vault platform provides all of the essential security controls needed for complete threat detection in one easy to use and affordable solution. With its integrated security controls and expert threat intelligence from the Alien Vault Lab security research team, you don't need to deploy and manage numerous security point products. Spend your time responding to threats rather than researching them with Alien Vault. Visit alienvault.com slash cyberwire today and download your free 30-day trial of Alien Vault Unified Security Management. Take a moment, check it out at alienvault.com slash cyberwire. And we thank Alien Vault for sponsoring our show. I'm Dave Bittner in Baltimore with your CyberWire summary for Wednesday, November 23rd, 2016. ISIS hasn't left the news, but its activities have recently been eclipsed by election hacking, national privacy and censorship policies, and of course, risks of retail cybercrime. And we'll have observations on that cybercrime shortly. But ISIS shouldn't be forgotten. Its online recruiting continues with disturbing rumors of attempts to quietly and surreptitiously recruit technical talent from schools and universities. The group is also showing signs of following a trajectory familiar with maturing terrorist groups. Its online activities are increasingly difficult to distinguish from for-profit criminality. This shift can be seen in ISIS tactics, too. The familiar howling of inspiration to the lone wolves is still there, but observers are also seeing an upswing in phishing and spamming. ISIS opponents haven't been idle in cyberspace either. Australia's Prime Minister Turnbull yesterday told Parliament that, yes, the Australian Signals Directorate has indeed been engaged in offensive cyber operations against the Islamic State. He declined to give details for obvious reasons of security, but he also cautioned businesses and individuals to remain on their guard. In the U.S., disagreement over U.S. Cyber Command's conduct of operations against ISIS is said by some to have contributed of rumored discord between the current administration and the director, NSA. As businesses continue to face a range of cyber attacks, various organizations and standards bodies continue to propose measures that would offer both carrots and sticks as incentives for better enterprise security. The hoods themselves are taking notice of these stick-side incentives. Heimdall Security sees signs that ransomware purveyors are adding the threat of regulatory and legal penalties to their extortion notes. Since the Internet of Things has now been proven to contribute to the risk of cyber attack, particularly distributed denial-of-service attacks, the Broadband Internet Technology Advisory Group, BITAG, believes it's time the IoT industry faced what BITAG considers some unpleasant facts. First among these facts is this. Forget about end-users actually updating the software on their devices. It's just not going to happen. So BITAG recommends that industry build mechanisms for secure automatic updating into their devices. BITAG is influential. It was founded in 2010 by industry leaders including Google, Intel, Verizon, Comcast, Microsoft, and Time Warner Cable. The CyberWire received reactions to the report from Synopsys and Rubicon Labs. Rubicon's Rod Schultz called the recommendations comprehensive and insightful, but short on incentives. Quote, the challenge is that the power of the IoT is rapidly being realized and so far its velocity is not impacted by security. A Hammurabi code for IoT security needs to come with consequences, and unfortunately these recommendations may simply go down in history as aspirational dreams. Mike Amadi of Synopsys Software Integrity Group also had a mixed reaction. 
Quote, while I certainly applaud efforts to set guidelines for dressing security in IoT devices, I remain concerned by a complete lack of baseline verification and validation of cybersecurity. End quote. He thinks some form of certification is in order and necessary if guidelines are to ultimately have effect. Europol has released more details on its recent sweep of money mules. The second European money mule action ran last week from the 14th to the 18th of November 2016. Some 580 suspects were identified and 380 were interviewed, leading to 178 arrests. The International Police Agency says it made the arrests with the cooperation of authorities in 16 European countries and the assistance of the U.S. Secret Service and FBI. 106 banks and other private partners also supported the operation. The mules were implicated in crimes that inflicted an estimated 23 million euros in losses. The other major long-standing cyber crime wave currently under international investigation involves jackpotting, that is, manipulation of ATM firmware to induce the machines to kick out large quantities of cash, like a one-armed bandit disgorging a jackpot. Russia-based security firm Group 1B, which has been investigating, says the Cobalt Gang has been jackpotting ATMs in Europe and Asia. A great deal of the activity has occurred in former Soviet republics. The crime wave has been in progress since July of this year. The boot trap group has earned its own notoriety for hitting ATMs in Thailand and Taiwan. Indian authorities are dealing with their own crime spree, and this one looks more like conventional carding. Some 3.2 million pay cards are thought to have been compromised. The police are looking into it, and consumers are advised to pay close attention to the security of their accounts. In the U.S., we're just two days away from the oddly named Black Friday, by recent tradition the door-busting start of the holiday shopping frenzy. The Americans aren't alone here either. Thanksgiving may be an American holiday, but shoppers are hitting their stride elsewhere as well. And there's no shortage of advice on staying safe over the long weekend and into the new year. You'll find a full sampling of that advice in today's CyberWire Daily News Briefing, so please read and heed. It's time to take a moment to tell you about our sponsor, Recorded Future. Recorded Future is the real-time threat intelligence company whose patented technology continuously analyzes the entire web, developing cyber intelligence that gives analysts unmatched insight into emerging threats. At the CyberWire, we subscribe to and profit from Recorded Future's Cyber Daily. As anyone in the industry will tell you, when analytical talent is as scarce as it is today, every enterprise owes it to itself to look into any technology that makes your security teams more productive and your intelligence more comprehensive and timely. Because that's what you want. Actionable intelligence. Sign up for the Cyber Daily email and every day you'll receive the top trending indicators, recorded future captures crossing the web. Cyber news, targeted industries, threat actors, exploited vulnerabilities, malware, and suspicious IP addresses. Subscribe today and stay a step or two ahead of the threat. Go to recordedfuture.com slash intel to subscribe for free threat intelligence updates. That's recordedfuture.com slash intel. And we thank Recorded Future for sponsoring our show. Joining me once again is Joe Kerrigan. He's from the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute. Joe, uh, nice to have you back. I know you recently uh, attended the NICE conference. You wanted to share some of the things you learned from there. First of all, tell us what is the NICE conference? Uh, the NICE conference is for the NICE uh, program, which is the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education. Hmm. Within NIST, which is the National Institute for Standards and Technologies, all these great government That's acronyms. Right. That's right. Um, one of the things that the NICE, the NICE project does is they release the NICE framework for cybersecurity education. They just released a new draft, uh, and that's actually open for public comment. If you go to the NICE website at NIST, you can download that, read it, and actually comment on it if, if, you, if, you, would, if you are so inclined. And, and you came back uh, having some insights. There were some, some interesting uh, discussions that you, that you, uh, that you were yeah, part of. Yeah, uh, one of the most interesting things that I found was uh, there, this is a, a meeting of people in government, academia, and, and business. And there was, there was uh, a general consensus of something I've suspected but haven't really been able to articulate. In cybersecurity, there is a real disconnect between uh, the, the, employee, the employee pool the recruiters and the hiring managers. And I'm not saying there isn't a shortage of cybersecurity workers, there is, uh, but 
there's also this disconnect. Like there, I heard this horror story where there was a uh, a position that was opened, an entry level position. The hiring recruiter listed a CIA SSP as one of the requirements for this entry level position. The CIA SSP is a credential that that takes five years in the industry before you can hold the credential. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a recruiter who doesn't understand the industry. Uh, and this is not unique to, uh, to cybersecurity in my experience. This is fairly common across a lot of technical fields. So, uh, so let's back up and, and dig into that a little bit. I mean, so so basically they're saying we, it's sort of a catch-22 because right. they're saying this is an entry-level position with an entry-level salary. However, however, we're going to require that you have this experience credential that usually pays a lot more, that usually uh, uh, requires a premium of the employer to the employee when they have it. And then they, they wonder why they aren't and getting... Then they wonder why they can't fill the position. Right, exactly. Interesting. Uh, it's because nobody with a CISSP is going gonna, is gonna to even apply for an entry-level position because they've already got, at a minimum, five years' experience in the field. So, I mean, I mean, to be fair, there's, certainly we can't put the blame on all recruiters. I'm sure there are some out there who are who are who are up on these things and well, are being absolutely. successful in hiring. But what you're saying is is that when there is this sort of disconnect, that this disconnect is, exists. It is a real thing. Yes, it people is. are talking about it. It's a big enough deal that it was being talked about at this at this conference. And so it's an area where people need to be aware and and try to try to fix it. What I think it is. What I think. I'm not disputing the problem that there's not enough people in STEM and in cybersecurity. Right. But I think that, that this situation, this, this disconnect that we're talking about, makes just exacerbates that problem. Ah, gotcha. All right, Joe Kerrigan, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. My guest today is Gordon Carrera. He's a journalist with the BBC covering national security. His latest book is Cyber Spies, The Secret History of Surveillance, Hacking, and Digital Espionage. On Tuesday, November 29th, Gordon Carrera will be appearing at the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. to discuss the book. The preface of your book starts with the sentence, the computer was born to spy. Explain what that means. Well, I, I mean it in two senses. One is that if you go back into the history of it, the first computer in what many people consider to be a computer, a semi-programmable machine, electronic machine, um, was, in my mind, built at Bletchley Park. And it was built to help with spying. So it was a machine called Colossus, um, um, built in Britain to help with code breaking, one specific area of spying. So in, in that sense, the computer, the first computer, was born to help with spying. But then I think in the more general sense, what I mean is that computers are uniquely useful for and vulnerable to spying and espionage. In other words, there's something intrinsic to computers and especially networked computers that makes them valuable to spies and also vulnerable to being spied on by other people. And I think that history that spying and computers are, are, are intrinsically linked and there's an interwoven history there right from the last 70 years through to today, which I, I think explains much about cybersecurity. I think certainly there's this Hollywood notion of, of spying, uh, of this sort of gamesmanship, you know, James Bond and Mission Impossible, those sorts of things. How much do those align with the reality? Well, I think, you know, I think for a long time the public perception of intelligence work was, um, you know, out of sync with the reality and i think you know for a long time people still in the popular imagination had the visions of john le carré and kind of docu you know dead documents uh, dead drops for documents or they had the vision of james bond and and the kind of guns and fast cars and it took a long time really for the popular imagination and understanding to catch up with what data and technology had done to spying uh, i mean and it's interesting it took a while for the the spies to really understand what data was going to do to them. I mean, if you look at the world of human intelligence, so put aside the kind of NSA and GCHQ and the electronic signals intelligence, I mean, data has been transformative for human spying because, you know, 10, 15 years ago, suddenly these intelligence agencies like the CIA, like MI6, realized that all the ways they operated um, were, 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 were no longer going to be possible. So you couldn't just pick up a passport and a false name and travel to another country anymore to meet an agent because suddenly there were biometric databases. Suddenly there were uh, people were going to do online searches and look at your social media to see what whether your cover, whether your legend stood up. 
And so suddenly there was this realization that actually the data trails people left were going to fundamentally transform the spying business. And so even the the old world, if you like, of human intelligence has now been totally transformed by technology and by data. And it's enabled it in some ways, but it's also challenged it enormously. And effectively, only those who can adapt to that will survive in the future, because in a data rich environment, if you don't know what data trail you're leaving, you can get caught if you're a spy. But also, if you understand how to exploit data, you can find the people you're after, the potential agents you want to recruit much better. So that's just the the world of human intelligence, let alone the kind of the speed at which the technical intelligence world, the signals intelligence world has, has changed over the last few years, where they are constantly trying to keep on top of the the, the, the data volume, the data velocity, the variety of, of different applications people are using. I think about how, you know, people are encrypting their day-to-day communications today. You know, things like iMessage has end-to-end encryption. Uh, Your Mm. book mentions that there was a meeting at Stanford in the 70s that was a bit of a turning point uh, when it comes to these sorts of things. That's right. And I think, you know, this, this, you, you hear the talk about the crypto wars that are going on at the moment and this battle over how far there should be strong encryption and end-to-end encryption available to people in in, in the 70s. And I, I, I talked to um, um, uh, Martin Hellman and, and Whit Diffie, who went on to develop one of the, the you know most famous um, public key uh, encryption techniques, and um, who, who were at this meeting in Stanford, effectively over the table from people from the NSA who had come over and um, to talk to them, and to have this debate about how strong encryption should be that the public could use. And back then, I mean, this was a huge battle and and, and, and Diffie and Hellman were there arguing that um, people could not trust the state and therefore they needed to have stronger encryption and to be sure there were no back doors in it and to be confident about it. And actually, you know, when you read the, because the transcript and the audio of that meeting still survives, it's very interesting because the context is Watergate and, and a concern over how the state might um, exploit that information and a, and a fear about it. And on the other side of the table, you've got veterans of the NSA, one who'd been actually part in World War II, who is offended by the idea that he might he might be breaking codes in order to spy on the American people. In his mind, it, it, it's something that's vital for national security because um, enemy actors, you know, adversaries are using the same forms of encryption. And if they're released into the wild, then uh, into the public, then then those adversaries will be using them. So. You know, these these battles about encryption, which I think is absolutely central, go back decades. And that Stanford meeting, I think, is a really important starting point. As you were writing the book, were there any things that that surprised you or provided unexpected insights? I think it surprised me at how deep the history was of cybersecurity and computer security. I mean, we think of them as very recent terms and cyber being something that's kind of last 10 years. But as I said, if you... If you go back, you can find um, computer security way back in the 60s. And some of the reports like this famous Anderson report um, written for the US government um, in the early 70s actually outlines much of what people worry about today. And this was kind of 45 years ago. Um, uh, And I think, you know, if you look at some of the phrases about big data and exploiting big data and understanding anomalous behavior, it's talked of as if it's very new. Actually, the intelligence agencies were doing this in the Cold War with Soviet communications and doing traffic analysis and large scale traffic analysis. So I think what was interesting writing it was understanding, well, what's, what's really new and what's not new and we just kind of think of as new because we didn't really understand the history enough. That's Gordon Carrera. He'll be discussing his book, Cyber Spies, next Tuesday, October 29th at the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. And that's the CyberWire. We'll be taking a break for Thanksgiving, but we'll be back as usual on Monday. In the meantime, our best wishes to all of you for the holiday. On behalf of everyone here at the CyberWire, we're truly thankful that all of you value and enjoy the work we do. For links to all of today's stories, along with interviews, our glossary, and more, visit thecyberwire.com. Thanks to all of our sponsors who make the CyberWire possible. The CyberWire podcast is produced by Pratt Street Media. Our editor is John Petrick. Our social media editor is Jennifer Iben, And our technical editor is Chris Russell. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. And I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening.